Good afternoon. My name is Molly Martin, and I'm the director of New America Indianapolis. New America is a nonpartisan, nonprofit think tank based out of DC, but I work here in Indianapolis, where I've lived for 20 years, and focus my work on the Midwest, the Rust Belt, and the Upper South. I'm really pleased to be here today with my co-leads and partners at the Indianapolis Recorder for the third in a series on COVID in the Black community. Today, we'll be talking about something incredibly timely, pressing, and uh, certainly sad, frankly, that uh, Black Americans and Black Hoosiers are seeing disproportionately poor outcomes from COVID-19 and there are systemic reasons and social reasons and we're going to talk a little bit about that today and I know that Dr. Kane's office is joining us and, and we're we'll very excited to see the county folks and I'll introduce the rest of our panelists in a moment but I do want to start quickly by acknowledging that when New America Indianapolis talks about issues related to race and issues related to the Black community we have some principles that we share. Uh, first, Black voices are critical to everything we do, solutions design. Obviously, Black voices are a leading part of our community as they are in any community. We also acknowledge that systemic racism and biases impact every aspect of our social, economic, and cultural lives. Black lives matter. Race and ethnicity are not the same. The Black community is not a monolith. And as talking about health, in talking about healthcare and the economy and the COVID-19 outbreak, the word vulnerable tends to come up a lot. Uh, sometimes we mean vulnerable economically, sometimes we mean vulnerable in terms of social determinants of health due to systemic biases, uh, due to history of marginalization. So just keep in mind that when we say vulnerable, we kind of mean a myriad of things. Now that I've said that, I'd like to introduce our panelists and then I'll, I'll hand it over to my wonderful co-moderator. Today joining us, we have Dr. Virginia Kane, the director of the Marion County Public Health Department, Mr. Carl Ellison, the president and CEO of Indiana Minority Health Coalition, Ms. Antoinette Holt, Office of Minority Health at the Indiana State Department of Health, Dr. Erica Huddleston of Community Health Network, Dr. Woody Myers, a physician, of a, the owner of Myers Ventures and the former State Health Commissioner of the State of Indiana, and Dr. Jennifer Sullivan, the Secretary of the Family and Social Service Administration for the State of Indiana. We're so glad to have you here today. We're so glad to have all of you across the country joining us for the conversation. This will be a bit of a roundtable format, so uh, thank you in advance for submitting your questions and keeping those coming. I'd like to turn it over to my co-moderator extraordinaire, Oshia Boyd, the editor of the Indianapolis Recorder, our partners in this project. Oshia, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Molly. Um, as you said, this is a very important discussion. We have a panel full of doctors. I feel a little intimidated because I don't have doctor uh, next to my name. <laughs> so um, we're going to try to make sure that we get some of these important questions answered and we talk about some very, we talk about some very important um, aspects of COVID-19 that are affecting the Black community. Uh, statewide, Indianapolis, and nationwide. I want to get started with some data that we just learned recently. The state of Indiana released data on Friday, and I know this is an ongoing uh, thing that we're going to keep doing is releasing data. But for the first time, we released data on Friday uh, about Indiana statistics when it comes to Black Americans, Black Hoosiers. The initial data, 18.5% uh, cases are African American. 19.2% death rate for, for African Americans. That is very disheartening when you think about the numbers. We only make up 9.8% of the state's population. So uh, those numbers are, they're not Indianapolis local numbers, they're statewide. Um, but I'm just imagining that we can expect to see the same in Indianapolis. We can expect to see the same as we're seeing in Chicago, where 70% of COVID-19 deaths are African American, Milwaukee 81%. Um, again, disheartening numbers. Residents, I've, I've been reading reading up on as I prepare for this uh, panel discussion. Residents of majority Black counties have three times the rate of infection, and almost six times the rate of deaths as residents in majority White counties. So this is why this panel, this discussion is so important we are talking about something that deeply affects our community. And when you said vulnerable, this definitely shows how vulnerable we really are and truly are to not just COVID-19, but many health disparities, but how this affects those other co comorbidities we have. So <laughs> thank you. So I'd like to get started first with you, Dr. Erica Huddleston. How are you doing today? 
I think you need to unmute yourself. Here we go. Doing hey, well. Hey. Thank you. This is this is tricky when you're when you're going back and forth doing this. How are you doing? Doing well. Thank you. Good. That's good. So I don't want to um, hit you with a tough one just yet, but I want to ask you what. A few weeks ago, there's a lot of information cir circulating, um, social media, hearsay, people talking. There seems to be less misinformation today than it was before. But what do, in your opinion, do people need to know? Do black people need to know about COVID-19? I think understanding just the basics of the virus. I mean, it's a respiratory virus. It's gonna be spread by a sneeze or a cough and those droplets are what are carrying the virus. Um, you can, contract the virus if it's on surfaces and you end up touching your eyes, nose, or mouth. That's not the most common way that it's uh, contracted though. And this is a virus that in many people, it doesn't have a lot of side effects or symptoms, but those who are at increased risk or who have underlying health conditions, they're the population at risk. And uh, we have to take that in mind um, moving forward. When you say underlying risk, what is that? Because I know some people may have asthma, but they're pretty healthy. They exercise, they do a lot of things, and they don't really necessarily consider themselves unhealthy. So when we say underlying risk, what does that mean? Sure. So these chronic health conditions, um, things like heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, um, obesity, severe asthma, these conditions are all going to predispose you to being at more risk if you are um, around the virus or contracted because your immune system is already stressed from dealing with these day-to-day -day, um, chronic conditions. So the virus poses more of a stress on your body and it overwhelms it in a sense. That's something I think people don't think about is the stress your body is already under when you have a condition, that your body's already working hard to keep you healthy and then you add something else on top of that that is a respiratory illness, I think people may not be aware of that or think, have that type of mind. Now, um, recently, the U.S. Surgeon General, Jerome Adams, he discussed the things you're talking about, health conditions that people already have, asthma, heart condition, high blood pressure, prediabetes, and he called this a legacy of growing up poor in Black in America, which, when I read those words, I just had to stop and just think for a minute, like, wow, that's something that is so profound and so deep. Um, when we talk about the legacy of growing up poor and black in America, and then you have COVID-19 on top of that, what, what are the impacts that we can, people can expect from this illness if you already have something? Are you, is it gonna be that you, it's gonna exasperate your other illnesses as well, or is just totally respiratory and that's all it is? So this is a multifaceted question because it depends on what underlying factors you have, definitely. Um, yes, it can predispose you to having a more severe reaction to the virus. So in some people say, oh, I just had cough and cold and I got over it rather quickly. Other people you hear they end up in the ICU on a ventilator. And so it does affect people differently based on their underlying kind of basis of health and their chronic conditions overall. Um, unfortunately, we see a higher concentration of these chronic diseases in our black and brown communities. And does that affect your ability to bounce back too when you have an underlying condition? Exactly. Okay. So I read, um, I did a little bit of research on you <laughs> and on your uh, YouTube page, um, you made a statement on your profile about, about who you are as a doctor. And one of the things you want to do is create the, a bond and trust with your patients. Mm -hmm. And I'm imagining, I don't know you, I'm imagining that part of the reason why you feel like that is so important is because you understand as a black woman that distrust that uh, we tend to have when it comes to people in the medical community. Can you expand a little bit on why that's so important to you? Definitely. Um, yes, definitely coming from a black community and growing up right here on the east side of Indianapolis, I've been blessed to actually have had wonderful doctors and healthcare providers um, in my life. But I know a lot of people have had very disheartening situations and things that they've come across. Um, sometimes they feel like they're not heard by their doctors or their uh, providers. Um, and that 
overall will affect how often they come see their doctor. Um, we've noticed people don't schedule regular appointments if they're not comfortable with the provider that uh, they're, they're linked up with. So just taking that time to establish care with a primary care provider, not an emergency department, you wanna make sure you have a primary care doctor or provider who knows you one-on-one, -on -one, who knows your medical background and your history. And um, over time, you're going to build trust just from showing up for those annual health visits and exams and um, those check-ins with your provider on a regular basis. How do you help your fellow colleagues understand this I see a smile, I see a little. <laughs> how do you help your fellow colleagues understand this distrust and how important it is to build that trust? I think starting with a baseline of, do you wanna be healthy and how can I help you in your journey? Because you do have to take some personal responsibility for your own health. Um, but once you have decided to make that change and journey, we're here for you and I make sure my patients understand that I am there to help guide them through all the ups and downs of chronic care management. Even if you're healthy, you still need to see your doctor at least once a year. Um, so it's important to kind of establish that baseline so they know moving forward, you've always got your provider there to discuss or chat with if you've got questions or concerns. And um, that's really what I like them to know. Well, and you mentioned something that I think when we talk about health, we always want to have personal accountability. We always want to make sure that we, we recognize that we do have some ownership of our own health. But so many times when it comes to talking about Black Americans, we are blamed for situations that, for systemic uh, challenges that we have nothing to do with that we can't control. We know that many times when you go to, when you're in pain, you go to the hospital, you're, you're kind of looked at, oh, you're not in as much pain as you say, you just want drugs. You know, it's those kind of things that we often battle so when we're talking about how do we how do we battle this how do we advocate for ourselves um in this system that sometimes doesn't believe what we're saying sure and i think that goes back to establishing a relationship uh, with a primary care provider um, who can then be an advocate for you speak to your specialists and other caregivers um, that are helping to manage your health um, it's interesting that you bring that up because Community did receive a grant from Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services um, to address specific unmet health related needs. And these things like food, um, interpersonal violence, transportation issues, these were all addressed during this uh, grant. And now we're able to screen some of our high risk patients right when they come in the office. Um, identify what needs they have um, that may impact their health, and then we connect them with the appropriate resources during their office visit. That is something you said you connect them with their resources. Mm -hmm. Often we um, don't know the resources and, and primary care. So it sounds like that we need to have a primary care provider to advocate for us to know what's going on with us, and that primary care provider can help us navigate the web of, of medical professionals out there. Because just me as Oshia, I get online, I try to find a doctor. I may not find the right doctor or the one, the doctor I need, but if I talk to my primary care provider, you're saying that will help me find the doctor I need. Definitely. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to um, COVID-19 though, when we are, are so, one thing I've been concerned about is life has not stopped. People are still getting sick with other things. Um, I just had a family member who, who was chopping something and cut his hand. So it's those kind of things that are still happening every single day. How do we, as we're worried about um, COVID-19, how do we also make sure we're not inundating you guys? <laughs> Sure. You sound like this is a, something that you've been talking about. <laughs> you look like this is something you've been talking about. How do we make sure we're not inundating you guys and, and with, with different things and worry, um, but that you can still do your jobs effectively? Sure. You know, and that's one of the biggest concerns. Um, our healthcare provider team, our nurses, our doctors, our medical staff in the hospital, and outpatient, we were all concerned how do we manage 
uh, this in a time where everything, this is all new. Um, so what we are um, asking is that you continue social distancing. That truly is helping to decrease the amount of people who are exposed to the virus, which in turn flattens that curve that a lot of people have been talking about. And that curve is really what we want to flatten so that we don't overwhelm the healthcare system. Because you're right, people are still getting sick. And this is in addition to all of the new COVID cases that are being admitted. Um, so we um, at Community are providing virtual visits. So you can talk to your doctor um, any day of the week almost. And um, we have also created a few pub sites. So we have consolidated our med checks, um, our family medicine, pediatric, and internal medicine teams into one location in different areas of the city so that we can divert all of our normal resources inpatient to the hospital where they need it more. And uh, this is still allowing for patients to get regular care and access. You can still have video visits with your specialist or your provider uh, or even phone visits. And uh, we also have a phone uh, call team of providers who are on every night of the week to help field some of these questions and guide care. So it sounds like that you guys are being creative too in the way that you offer care to people. Because the, the idea is that you want to you wanna take care of the patients who may have COVID-19, but you also want to stop the spread exactly. of COVID-19. And you also want to keep yourselves healthy. Right. So that you can keep on practicing and helping other people. When, as, as, an, as an African-American woman, when you see the numbers of, for, of, of infections and, and the death rate for other African-Americans, for our community, as a doctor, what do you think that we need to do as, as a community, also in the medical community? What, what do you think needs to happen? You know, it's devastating looking at these numbers because these are friends and family and uh, people within our community that um, we could potentially have prevented from getting this disease. I think it's so important for us to realize social distancing, although it's uncomfortable and it's unusual, it is helping and it, it needs to be continued um, until further notice. I would say listen to what the CDC guidelines are putting out there and um, make sure that you are hand sanitizing, sterilizing, um, and think about things that you wouldn't normally sterilize and sanitize, like your cell phones. We don't realize how often we touch our phones and then touch our faces. Um, pens, light switches, doorknobs, uh, just things that you can do more regularly to prevent spread of disease. Um, wearing a mask if you're out in public and you do have a cough, that's important to prevent others from exposure to yourself because we have found that there are asymptomatic COVID cases. A lot of people carrying COVID who don't know that they have it. And so they're fine, but a cough or a sneeze from someone who's a carrier could infect that person standing next to you who can't fight the disease off as well as you might be able to. You said a couple key things there. Social distancing. I know for many black people, it's been hard to social distance. We are a, a communal people. We like to gather. It's been some nice days out there. We want to barbecue. Uh, uh, we want to, you know, have, we want to get together. We had Easter. It was hard not getting with family for Easter. But you said something that you may be asymptomatic. Right. And that's something I think we may not think about is that we may be asymptomatic, but you cough or sneeze and you may infect someone who will not be asymptomatic, who will have, who can have an underlying condition, who could be older and more susceptible. How do we kind of hit that message to make people who are a little bit, I don't want to say hard headed, <laughs> but who are having a hard time understanding why it's not affecting me, but how it could, you could spare someone in your community from, from having such an illness. I think if you think about that person standing next to you, it might be a stranger, but if you put a face on that person and you're considering that um, a member of your family, you know, a community member, someone who you may not have met, but knowing that you could save their life by staying at home, by wearing appropriate precautions, by washing your hands, um, by limiting your groups to 10 or fewer people at a time, 
if that could save that person standing next to you, um, I think that really has to be a factor. Thank you very much, Dr. Huddleston. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna pass it back to you, Molly. Thank you so much, Dr. Huddleston. And uh, uh, we start the conversation in that very important way, understanding the basics about the disease, your insights as a patient, as a provider, as an Indianapolis resident. And we're moving now to kind of build on that and understand from minority health advocates and providers in Marion County and statewide to take a grassroots perspective and an advocacy perspective and really understand what the data gaps are, what the trends are. And our experts in this part of the conversation will be Dr. Virginia Kane, the director of the Marion County Health Public Health Department, Mr. Carl Ellison, the CEO of the Indiana Minority Health Coalition, Dr. Jennifer Sub Sullivan, the Secretary of Family and Social Services here in the state of Indiana, and Ms. Antoinette Holt, uh, who runs the Minority Health Division of the Indiana State Department of Health. And Antoinette, I hope I didn't uh, ruin your title there. I apologize. Um, I want to kick off. Uh, it is Minority Health Month, so it's an important time to be having this conversation, COVID-19 or not. And Dr. Kane, I'm going to come to you first uh, okay. and ask you, um, and I do want to clarify because we have people from across the country that you are the lead of the Marion County Public Health Department. Marion County is home to Indianapolis right here yes. in the center. That's correct. Uh -huh. um, when you think about Minority Health Month and the messaging opportunities and challenges you have in reaching different parts of Marion County. Have you found any messaging difficulty around COVID-19 and the local Black community, or, or has it all just kind of been one blanket message? So no, I think that uh, based on the different um, patient populations and our different racial and ethnic populations, a lot of times what age has to do with it. Uh, some people in the inner city area may think this is a conspiracy that's out to uh, use this disease to get rid of them, so they may not always trust the government. Uh, and we have to look at, for a younger generation, so like our young teenagers, our young adults, uh, they may feel more invincible and feel that this doesn't um, apply to them. So we have to look at using different messengers, and different modes of how we get the message out. I may be an older person, I love the radio, and I don't watch television as, as much. And we may have individuals who don't watch radio or television. They don't have access to a computer or they don't really utilize computers. So we have to look at how do we reach those individuals. But if you don't mind, I want to go back a little bit to um, our prior speaker, because um, I'm, I'm really concerned that if we really want to change the paradigm of how some of our physicians who may not be of African American background and interacting with their patients, how do we change them? Well, it's going to take more than a patient talking to the physician to change their attitudes, because a lot of them may have unintended biases or unintended implicit biases that they're not even aware of. And so they need training and we need to hold them accountable. All hospitals that have providers, all academic centers that are doing training, have they had the training so they understand when they may be insulting someone. Just recently, I had some, and it's the young generation providers that are training that we're graduating, that we got to get them where they need to be. I had them insult one of our black patients who's got a master's degree, ran a very huge organization for the state, and yet acting like they only have like a third and fourth grade education in trying to explain things to them and saying, wow, you know, do you know the definition of this? Because they didn't bother to read the medical chart before going into a room and saw, because they saw an African-American patient just assume their third, fourth grader reading level, and I'm having a conversation with you. Now, if it had been the CEO of Lilly Pharmaceutical Companies there, I guarantee you they would have read the medical charts before going into the room. So we got to have these folks accountable to change the paradigms 
about how they are managing and treating our African American uh, patients, Hispanics, or any other racial group that may be vulnerable and burdened as a related to this issue. Thank you, Dr. King. That's a really powerful message about differentiated messaging and also a powerful message about saying what we mean and meaning what we say. You know, which patients are we talking about? Who are we talking to? And when we see wrong things, calling them out. Um, one of the challenges- And, they, and the sad part is they don't even, they, they don't mean any harm, some of them. They just really don't know. Right. They've never been educated. They don't even realize that they may be insulting uh, sure. patients. So this is why it's so critical that we've got to have them required to do some training. We've got to have special requirements of all providers related to this issue, especially our young generation. That's a great point. And I know that one of our audience members pointed out that the training has to be continual. Uh, this is not one and done. Maintaining and, and learning and building cultural competence, especially for public health emergencies, is something we have to keep doing. Yes, and, constantly. Constantly. And Dr. King, we will be back to you in a minute here, but I, I would like to hear from Mr. Ellison on the point you just made. So Carl, could you tell us a little bit about the Indiana Minority Health Coalition and reflect a little on the advocacy, the face of advocacy, when you hear a story like Dr. King's, when you hear that people are still being greeted with inadequate access or poor treatment from, from healthcare establishments. So start with telling us about yourself and, and then respond to Dr. Kane, if you would. Sure. Um, the Indiana Minority Health Coalition, we've been around for about 25 years. Uh, we uh, exist to eliminate health disparities and, and operate through a statewide network of about 22 uh, entities. So uh, we are around the state, primarily in the larger metropolitan areas uh, where our service area covers about where 95 percent of the Black, Latino, minority populations are in this state. So think of us as sort of a local anchor, a local uh, point of service, a local point of hearing uh, what's happened within the communities. Now, in our approach to eliminate health disparities, we tried over time to educate our way out of this. We do a lot of evidence-based education where it's sort of a save one soul at a time, so to speak. Uh, but, and, 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 but beyond that, we found the need to have a larger megaphone. So we put significant emphasis on advocacy over the last several years, where the presumption is that you can't really address health inequities if you don't understand them. You can't really have a strategic way of approaching them if you, if you don't have the data. So we have been largely uh, uh, focused on making sure our legislators understand public policy issues. So there's a significant IMC presence at the legislature every day. Uh, we spend a great deal of time looking at uh, proposed bills, looking at policies, providing some uh, input to legislators to try to help cultivate a sort of a more strategic, a more uh, tested way of addressing issues that we face. And, and we've also tried to focus on specific minority health topics. Now, of course, since health disparities exist across the board, you can choose cancer, heart disease, uh, no good, you can choose any, any, any health condition. And we can find some way to address it from minority health concern. We have typically tried to isolate at least one or more minority health conditions during Minority Health Month to bring attention to this. But the sad reality is that uh, most of us, or at least even many policymakers, cannot cite specific disparities if you ask them. They might be able to cite, for example, uh, infant mortality because we've made it a practice over the last several years to put a great deal of emphasis on that, particularly from our our governor and our legislative leaders, and we now talk about not infant mortality rates, but how many babies are those? Well, if, if, if I were to ask someone, do you know how many, what the disproportionate rate is among cancer uh, survivors or even cancer, people who die from cancer? Most leaders can't tell you that. So as we go forward, we're gonna have to change the paradigm where when we routinely talk health, we have to talk disparity. We have to make health disparity data information, more evident, more sort of a top of the mind, as you begin health discussions. Typically, if we're going to address an area of health equity, we don't do that in a more specific targeted manner so people can understand it at the local level. So for example, if I were to look at the state health plan and say, okay, what's the plan in St. Joseph County to reduce health disparities to health equity? There's no such document. So, so we go about health equities in a way in the blind. It's more a work of faith. 
not a work of strategic thinking, not a, not a work of data gathering. So we've got to, on a go forward basis, not just for, with respect to Novia, but with respect to uh, addressing health equities in general. We've got to be much more specific, much more willing to articulate the differences and to make sure that's part of the conversation up front and that we include communities with colors in this conversation. I mean, she's really been trying to do this for 25 years. We just now see an urgency to engage the policymakers and others in a more strategic discussion to make sure we're always at the table, always helping to assure that the health disparity agenda is top of the mind as we discuss policies, resource allocation, and all the various things that we can and should do to achieve greater health outcome for this state and nation. Uh, obviously, unless we can do that, our, our productivity as a nation will decline. So it's kind of in everybody's interest now to be more conversant of health disparities. Thank you, Mr. Ellison, that's so helpful. And I think what you point out and what Dr. Kane pointed out get to the heart of this program. It's very important to talk, to talk about and understand COVID-19 and disparities in outcomes and access related to COVID-19. But what this crisis has done is put in stark relief, something that everyone on this call has known for a long time, uh, that these disparities exist and existed before. You talk a little bit about kind of the state approach. And, and we think in Indiana, especially for those on the phone who, who don't live here, uh, we think of Marion County and Indianapolis as having kind of the lion's share of the state's black population. But that's not entirely true. Uh, there are black Hoosiers across the state. There are black Hoosiers in rural areas in our larger towns, uh, Fort Wayne, South Bend, certainly Lake County up in the region. Um, so I'd actually like to come, I'll come back to you, Mr. Ellison, but I'd like to go to our friends from the state uh, and, and Ms. Holt and, and Dr. Sullivan and hear a little bit about state data and state impact. Oshia introduced some, some of the data on rates of infection and rate of hospitalizations for Black Hoosiers. What are things looking like statewide right now in relation to COVID-19? Um, actually, I know that you guys work as a team. I'm gonna come to Ms. Holt first and then go to Dr. Sullivan. I was hoping that you go to Dr. Sullivan first and then come back to me. <laughs> She got the data data. Um, we, we can certainly flip flop if you'd like. <laughs> she said, no, go ahead. OK. <laughs> um, I think it's important while talking about data that we explain in regards to because there's been a lot of questions as to why it takes so long for data, data gaps and different things. So addressing that real quick, um, usually on average, when we would collect data, it would take a process of a couple of weeks or different things because we would clean the data. We would make sure it's accurate. We would make sure that we were inclusive of, of everything. And so now we are being put in a situation where we have to turn data around in a 24 hour period. So you're gonna see numbers fluctuate. It's also important that we note that we, we it's important and imperative that we are collecting racial and ethnic data. So then we can understand the populations that we need to serve, especially those most vulnerable, and then how to address those populations. I think people, uh, certain people that have already talked to talked about the importance of making sure that we are inclusive of the target populations that we have, that they're at the table in the beginning and not an afterthought. It's very important um, uh, that advocates that are on this panel and beyond are part of the solution because again, you know, if you're not at the table, you're being served for lunch. So we don't want that. We wanna make sure that we are being inclusive of that. Um, data gaps, I know that we have been working on in regards to making sure that we get that because we have um, no set standardization as far as reporting. There are some guides and guidelines in regards to reporting, but there's no set overall over agencies nationwide different things as far as here's the set measure as far as reporting and so then that can make it difficult in regards to reporting numbers and things too um, and so we are constantly trying to work and improve on our ways that we collect our data um, and how to make it I think we need to address I think Dr. Kane you know I was like wow Dr. Kane taking all my notes um, we we need to address systematic and structural barriers and that does involve class standards uh, culturally grossly appropriate services. We need to make sure that the people um, that are on the front line are asking these questions as far as race and ethnicity, because um, that's a process too. And then also we need to make sure that people understand the importance of why we collect racial and ethnic data. Sometimes people are apprehensive when someone asks them their race and ethnicity to give it to them, 
but it's just like the census. I would, I would dare to say how many people filled out their census because it was due this month. Um, but that information really does help us in regards to when we have to figure out programming, when we have to do different things like that. So it, it really assists us in that. And so the set numbers that we presently have that you can find on the website or Dr. Sullivan would talk about um, allows you just to kind of see where we're at in the state. So thank you so much, uh, first of all, for um, having me on today. Um, I, I worked at uh, the Indiana State Department of Health as the Deputy Health Commissioner for two years and with Antoinette, and she is just one of my favorite people. Um, and, and so many other folks on the screen are as well, so thank you. And you might wonder why the Family and Social Services Administration would have anything to do with this public health response. Um, social services and healthcare delivery often um, don't factor in when we talk about public health responses, but from the outset of Indiana's global pandemic response, um, the Family and Social Services Administration has been tasked with some big, I think really critical and important jobs. Uh, we deliver healthcare and social services to about one in five Hoosiers during normal times. And we knew that that number was going to increase potentially dramatically, and it has uh, during this pandemic. And we have a special relationship at FSSA with group. We may have lost Dr. Sullivan for a minute. Oh, oh there she is meeting unmet uh, social needs. So our, our early big projects were um, building out SNAP, TANF, Medicaid, and Child Care Development Fund access to individuals. In addition, we launched Operation Food with community networks and the National Guard, quickly producing a map that shows in real time where Hoosiers can find food near them. We also facilitated safe recovery sites for individuals experiencing homelessness and worked closely with individuals and families um, with aging loved ones and individuals with disabilities as well. And we bolstered access to mental health services along with non-emergent, non-pandemic medical care through the convenience and safety of telemedicine and Medicaid. And in these efforts, uh, we also knew the gaps in Indiana's health outcomes that predated this pandemic would be even more exposed now than they were before. So health disparities or differences in health outcomes for different groups are not new to Indiana and are a top priority for both healthcare, public health, and social services. Um, Dr. Kane and, 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 Dr. and Mr. Ellison uh, talked about infant mortality. Our OB Navigator project uh, with many of the partners on the phone here, for example, is based on blending what we know works in healthcare and public health to improve infant and maternal, maternal mortality with a community level social determinants of health approach for groups who continue to have disproportionately poor outcomes. And our black mortal, infant mortality rate is starting to improve um, because of this collaborative approach. But in addition to health disparity, we also have to address health inequity, which is harder to talk about because it means that health disparities are happening because our systems have design flaws that cause harm. And this is the inherent and often not recognized bias that happens in our communities, our socioeconomic structure. And unfortunately, like Dr. Kane said, even in the halls of medicine um, that places minority populations at greater risk for poor outcomes than disease qualities would predict alone. And we're seeing that uh, exacerbated um, with this pandemic. And Indiana's data that Antoinette talked about suggests that we are no different than other states experiencing these issues um, in the pandemic. And I, I think this is an ongoing tragedy that is mitigated by a, a lot of different things, but I'd like to suggest in, uh, to this, this group and, and the things that we're thinking about at FSSA that one is acknowledgement, two is partnership to better understand, three is changing our structure to, con to recognize bias before harm occurs, four is active outreach for groups that have been uh, systematically marginalized, and five is comprehensive understanding of the needs of individuals and families who we are asking to do really difficult strategies like social distancing that may be harmful for them. For example, um, individuals who have suspected COVID that are seen in the emergency department, which is why I'm dressed funny after this, I'm heading into my shift. Um, we have to ask a few important questions before these folks go home, if they're safe to go home. One, can, can you isolate safely? Are you in a safe place? Do you have access to food? Do you have access to cleaning supplies? 
um, do you have access to um, the medicines or a way to contact your doctor if you need them? And this should be part of all emergency care. And the opportunity to do this better now and in the future is not lost on any of us. So, you know, we, we believe at the state, the local, the advocacy, the grassroots level that Hoosiers, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, geography, or income, should and will have access to testing and access to high quality care that's free of bias. That is a, a goal for today, not for the future. And we have to both acknowledge and seek to reduce health outcome gaps across the state. And to do that, we have to analyze our data. We have to see what Indiana looks like and we have to mitigate those gaps um, for disparities in this disease process. And then continue to educate our essential teams in public safety and healthcare how to adapt our protocols so that we can care for everyone because that's our calling and, and that's our duty. Thank you so much, Dr. Sullivan. Dr. Kane, uh, Dr. Sullivan talked quite a bit about the importance of data, as did Ms. Holt. Um, gathering data, understanding data, disaggregating data by race or, race or ethnicity so we really know what we're dealing with. What is the status of disaggregated data on race and COVID in Marion County? So in Marion County, we're going to have a public release sometime this week, but I can tell you that when we look at our deaths right now, currently 40% of our deaths are occurring in whites, but 42% of the deaths are occurring in African Americans, so that our death rates are more than twice the number of deaths we're seeing in our white um, community. So definitely we're disproportionately being impacted um, by our rates. And if you, you look at it from a rate level, what I mean by rate, if you had 100,000 African-Americans, how many are dying out of 100,000? And it's 18 African-Americans were 100,000. But if you were a white patient, that number is eight people out of 100,000. So you can look at it both ways that you're seeing that African Americans are disproportionately being impacted uh, related uh, to this COVID-19. And you know, there are a number of underlying reasons for that um, has to do with more African Americans are more likely to have chronic medical conditions, uh, hypertension, for example. Um, they may have diabetes. Um, their weight may be higher than our standard weight we like to see that can impact somebody uh, if you're developing pneumonia or respiratory difficulties. In asthma, uh, chronic kidney diseases, and so because of these uh, different chronic medical illnesses, it impacts our immune system, all of these chronic medical conditions. So your immune system is not as normal as opposed to someone who doesn't have the chronic medical conditions. So it makes you way more vulnerable uh, to developing this infection compared to our other counterparts. But let me say one other thing. Because of our poverty level that we have in Marion County uh, in the African American community, I may not have a primary care provider. So I may get my medical care so the emergency rooms are urgent care, so it's intermittent. But because of poverty, and especially most of our African Americans are like in the food industry, you know, hospitality area, and whatever. So we've lost a lot of jobs. So I got to figure out how am I going to pay my rent? How I'm going to pay my food? Heaven help me to pay for a doctor's visit. So I'm going to wait until I'm, you know, feel I'm real, real sick before I go to the doctor. So sometimes it may result that by the time they're seeing their doctor, they may be way more sicker than the average person if they had good insurance or they had a primary care provider where we wouldn't have to, a lot of money coming out of our pocket, um, um, they could be seen earlier. And my a last point before I hard the show, you know, people assume that with no insurance, why are people not taking their medication? So, you know, we've had people who have the flu, we give them a prescription just for a five-day prescription for the flu that would prevent the death, 
And that prescription costs $125 just for a five-day treatment for the flu. But if you got diabetes and you may have hypertension to boot, you're paying the full retail cost of that medication because you're not part of an insurance where you can get a discount where I might be just paying $15 or, or $25. They're having to pay $200 for just one medication and may get up as much as $500 because they're paying the full retail value. So it's really scary that people may not be able to stay in good health because they can't afford medications. That's a really important point. And you know, Dr. Kane, you and the other panelists have pointed out a lot of the clinical and kind of predisposition issues around um, heightened rates of poor outcomes for Black Americans in this and in other health crises. But you've also hit on something really important, and I want to nod to, to Shelby Cummings at Local Initiative Support Corporation here in Indianapolis, who does social determinants of health work. She points out in the chat that a lot of poor outcomes for Black Americans are tied to their life outside of the clinical experience, their life outside of seeking health care, poverty, food insecurity, um, heightened numbers of Black Americans who work in frontline work and work in frontline work that is not necessarily protected uh, with gear, even though we know we have a gear shortage in healthcare, uh, whether that is materials moving or working in a grocery store, labor economics is a little more my area. And so, so we know that there are more black workers in Marion County and St. Joseph County up where Mr. Ellison is from who work in frontline work and kind of um, vulnerable work anyway in retail and they have a lot of contact. So when we think about these non-medical reasons for the increase in, in COVID and poor outcomes uh, for COVID-19 for Black Hoosiers. What role do healthcare advocates play in raising that, that flag? Ms. Holt, I'd love to start with you since you're with uh, the minority uh, division, the minority health division of the State Department of Health. Well, you're a healthcare public health specialist. Do you feel like it is also your job to talk about these social issues that, that are compromising Black Hoosier health? Yes, I think people forget that health encompasses all aspects of life. So it's not just so much how you feel, but it's everything from your environment thing that makes that difference. And so the Office of Minority Health is constantly trying to make sure that we are collaborating with different communities and populations and organizations to, uh, to create a support system that's going to be uh, effective in its approach of eliminating health disparities. And we can't do that by, our, by ourselves. You know, one can move a lot, but when the whole hand is working and the fingers are working, we can make a mighty blow. And so it's very important that we address um, those issues. It's, it's important that individuals that are advocates and things are at the table. Um, I cannot express that enough. I think it's very important that our leaders understand top down, bottom up, the importance of supporting, not just saying in name, health equity, but actually supporting it with resources and people and things and valuing the importance of why we need to take care of the people that we serve and not forgetting that and not forgetting those disparate populations that may not have a voice at the table or may not be sounding as loud. I think it's very important to empower people too in the community as far as what's going on because the more you know, the better you can do. You can make choices in different things that hopefully can help you or give them the resources and tools that they need in order to be successful. I think we've all kind of mentioned in regards to, it's hard to say okay to someone social distance and you're living five people in your home and your home is a set space. I can't, and maybe someone in your home is affected with the virus. So how do you take care of that? It's hard to tell someone that has to put food on the table, stop working or they've lost their job, what they're gonna do. And so just as Dr. Kane was talking about those that don't have insurance paying them out, if you have insurance, there are high deductibles that you have to meet before you can get your drugs. And so these necessary drugs that's supposed to help you with the underlying causes that you already have are exorbitant costs is like $400, $500. So you can't afford to get it. And so then you suffer. And so then uh, again, we have to address those biases because then you start to blame the patient or the person to say, well, you're not listening to what I'm doing. You're not listening to what I'm saying, but you're not looking at the whole entire effect. So yes, it's important to sound the alarm while we have a chance and opportunity. I know that we do that as a state office of minority health. Most states have a state office of minority health or a minority health entity that exists 
So striving, these men and women are striving every day to try to incorporate health equity in our policy to make sure that um, our laws and things are, are um, making sure that we are not forgetting the most vulnerable population. So yes, uh, sounding the alarm, making sure that you're part of the, the solution. And so I think that's how we're going to be effective. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Mr. Ellison, when you hear Ms. Holt's call, we have to be at the table. You have to have black voices at the table. You have to have affected populations at the table, black policymakers, uh, black epidemiologists. What if I'm an activist or I'm just a, a concerned voter and resident and I want to know how I can hold organizations and government accountable for making sure that there's racial diversity at these policymaking tables, where would I even start? Well, you can start anywhere, uh, where, whatever table you're at. One of the things, for example, uh, when we engage new organizations, I will often ask, what is the race ethnic composition of your board? What is the race ethnic composition of your staff? Do you have dollars in your budget set aside for minority concerns? Because the budget, the composition of the organization, the composition of trustees is a statement of commitment and a statement of, if you will, relevance to having minority voices be part of what the entity is doing. So one way, just simply just ask. Uh, secondly, though, I think a lot of organizations like ours that have that that are at the table, we collaborate with a lot. We're at a crossroads where we may have to become really more social justice organizations because it doesn't matter how much we do in health education, it doesn't matter how much we do in advocacy until the society and state fundamentally address the clear economic inequities which drive adverse health, which drive all the things that that we try to fight for after the fact. We've got to begin to do and maybe advocate for some, some very simple things. We try to stay in the health lane, so we don't typically say, well, you know, we ought to raise the minimum wage. After 10 or 15 years at $7.56 an hour, it's perfectly ludicrous to think that families who have to live on that can somehow make it. So we've got to be realistic in terms of our economic policy. We cannot uh, look at, uh, talk about the social terms of health if we don't address the social determinants. <laughs> and, and from a policy point of view, a resource allocation point of view, we don't systemically do that. And so uh, unless this state and nation decide to become a more equal society by our commitments, by our actions, by our knowledge, then we will always be at a disadvantage with respect to creating real change. Uh, we cannot educate our way. We cannot say it's a personal responsibility to achieve great health if we have a system that's stacked against poor people, and particularly people of color. It's time for this nation to make the state to make a commitment to greater equity. I mean, we we can measure it. We can, we can determine whether or not we make any progress there. But 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 you know, for us to worry about can we get Uber to take people to appointments for medical services in 2020, it's like come on now. We should have already had that solved. And so, uh, if this crisis doesn't do anything else, perhaps it will wake everyone up to the notion that we simply have to make a decision as a nation, state, and community to change how we've done business and to give greater commitment to assuring that we not only talk health equity, we not only talk about social terms of health, but we really do something about it. Thank you, Mr. Ellison. Uh, we will be back with this same crew and also back to Dr. Huddleston soon. We have lots of good questions coming in. But now that we've heard a little bit about the clinical and non-clinical reasons that are driving some of these rates, we've heard a little bit about state and local data. We'd like to hear a little bit more about the legacy of battling pandemics and epidemics in Indiana. So we'll be back to the rest of our panelists soon. But I'd like to hand back to Oshia, uh, who is going to interview one of our special guests today. Oshia. Thank you, thank you so much, Molly. Uh, thank you, Dr. Myers, how are you doing today? Pretty good, thank you. So I'd like for you to kind of introduce yourself and tell a little bit about your expertise. Uh, my name is Woody Myers. I'm a third generation Hoosier, born and raised here uh, in Indianapolis um, and uh, became a physician uh, years ago, uh, specializing in internal medicine, critical care medicine. Uh, was appointed uh, to be the health commissioner here in Indiana under two governors, uh, Governor Orr, then Governor Bai. Gone on to do a lot of other things in healthcare management and healthcare leadership uh, around the country and, in fact, around the world. I've seen a lot of different uh, 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 healthcare issues, problems uh, in just about every aspect of delivery, public health, research, teaching, and uh, came back uh, to. Uh, 
uh, my, my roots uh, and uh, become involved uh, more recently in politics. Um, I'm a uh, candidate for office, for public office. I'm running for uh, governor here in Indiana. And in part because I, I believe that the problems that are being discussed today, uh, the uh, inadequacies uh, in healthcare have not been well addressed, not just across the nation, but particularly here in, in my home state. Um, one of the things that concerns me the most as we get uh, into this discussion in more depth uh, is the investment that the state uh, has not yet made in solving the problems that have been very well described by uh, the, uh, the panelists uh, uh, this afternoon. Um, Indiana has underinvested uh, in uh, its uh, public health solutions. Uh, the uh, the, the uh, Trust for America's Health has uh, ranked Indiana number 49 of 50 states in terms of the dollar amounts that, that we invest. So uh, healthcare professionals like Dr. Sullivan and others can't do their jobs uh, if they don't have sufficient funds uh, in order to, to do them. We spend $17.58 a person compared to some states that spend over $60 a person on public health through our, our tax dollars. And that means that our public health infrastructure is far too weak. That's one of the reasons I believe that we haven't done as much testing as we should have done or could have done. That's one of the reasons why it's, it's taken our, our state healthcare professionals uh, uh, more time than I'm sure they would like to get us the numbers that we need because the infrastructure of, of providing that kind of information is inferior compared to, to uh, other states. So we have to put our, our, our money uh, where our hearts are. And that means that we have to increase by uh, a great amount the investment in public health uh, in Indiana, uh, such that the, the people that, that want to do the right thing, that understand uh, what we need to do, and do their jobs better. Thank you, thank you for that. When you talk about um, the situation we have now, this is not new for you. You've seen this issue of disparities for a very long time, and now it's playing out in a in a very in a very major way. Um, can you kind of talk about? We've heard disparity and equity. Why do we need to know about disparity, and what does health equity mean? How do we get there? Is this part of the investing? Is this part of the investing more money into the healthcare system in Indiana? Is that what gets us to equity? It's part of it, yes. Uh, the, 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 the easiest way to think of disparities are, are differences, and, and those differences uh, can have many, uh, many different causes. Uh, uh, one cause is, uh, as, as I've just mentioned, the underinvestment uh, in the system to get the results that we'd like to have. Uh, but there are other issues as well. Uh, there are disparities in the amount of research that is being done uh, on some of the, for instance, the genetic differences. We know, for instance, that, that African Americans have higher rates of high blood pressure uh, than, do, uh, than do many others. And, and uh, we, we understand that in part, it's because of how we process certain uh, enzymes uh, in, our, in our relationship to our kidneys. All of that uh, is now being exposed as a potential uh, source for some of the, uh, the causes of why uh, COVID-19 might be uh, disproportionately uh, uh, affecting the African-American community. So it's, it's both access issues uh, and it's a better understanding of the biology. Uh, so we need research uh, that looks into those. I've seen preliminary research that, that uh, makes a strong link uh, between uh, uh, what we call the renin and angiotensin system uh, in our bodies and, and, uh, and the uh, entrance of the uh, coronavirus. Uh, and I've also uh, seen and heard today uh, the stories from Dr. Kane uh, and others about uh, how we are not uh, getting the right kind of access to the services that do exist uh, and the inappropriate way some of our, 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 our uh, patients are being treated when they, when they become uh, part of the system or try to access the system. The number of people that have called me with their stories about their inability to get tested or, or the way they were treated when they, when they tried to, to, to get a test, all of that suggests that disparities are real, disparities are multifaceted, disparities do have solutions. Uh, one of those solutions is better investment, uh, but another solution is the one that Dr. Kane uh, outlined, and that's uh, making uh, understanding of cultural differences a part of the, t the teaching of uh, physicians and nurses in our state and, and, and making that uh, far more uh, uh, of a mandatory uh, experience for our students than an optional experience. And so I think that, that uh, professionals like uh, uh, Dr. Huddleston have identified uh, earlier on today that uh, some of her colleagues perhaps are, aren't approaching this in the way that, 
she would like to see or that she's doing. I, I just know we can do a better job if we work together and address all, all of these issues uh, that have been brought up. Thank you. you I kind of want to go back to something Mr. Ellison said, accountability. How do we hold our public officials accountable? How do we make sure that people who have an, a vested interest in black health are even at the table to hold those public officials accountable when they're talking about health issues um, that affect our community? I, I think that's also multifaceted. Uh, uh, Carl Ellison uh, mentioned that, that the boardroom is a very important place uh, uh, and that uh, we ought to make sure that, that there is equal representation in all the, the various boardrooms of the companies and the, and the not-for-profit entities that are providing healthcare services, that are providing healthcare products. And although that's a little better now than it was 10, 20 years ago, it's certainly nowhere near where it needs to be. And uh, certainly if we, we were to take a, a careful look at uh, who sits on the boards of our major uh, hospitals and uh, healthcare clinics uh, in our state, uh, there, there's plenty of room for improvement. And I also obviously believe that there's a, a route to, through our political system by electing people uh, to public office uh, at the state uh, level, of course, the local level and the national level, who not, not only care about these issues, but who are competent to do something uh, a, a, about them uh, carefully and efficiently with the public's dollars. Uh, uh, not wasting money on things that are frivolous or things that are that are fraudulent, uh, as we've seen examples of, uh, unfortunately, here, uh, but putting those dollars into places that can do much more good for the people that need that, uh, those services. And so I, I just know that it's both public and private sector uh, efforts that can uh, be improved uh, that will get us to where we want to be, and that's to equity. Uh, you, you mentioned equity as, uh, as, uh, as, an, uh, as an issue. It certainly should be everyone's goal. Uh, we, we are nowhere near where we would like to be with respect to equity. Uh, I know that, uh, that, that I can um, uh, advocate from the position I'm in, as can everybody else uh, that's, uh, that's on the panel today, but it's going to take uh, much more of this collective effort and forums like this one where we can discuss these problems uh, uh, openly and uh, propose solutions and debate the best way to go uh, because I know that if we we bring these problems out of the open and, and then talk through the solutions we can do a better job. So, saying that I had a question you kind of segue to a question I had when do we move though beyond talking and discussing and, and <laughs> to it's 2020 so these things are not new. When do we see some action? It's, it's time for action. It's really uh, past time for some action. Um, when do we get there? What is it going to take? What, are, what do we need to do? Do we need to mobilize, um, go down to the state house? What do we need to do to make the action happen? The yes, yes, and here. yes. All, all, <laughs> of your, all, all of your solutions are, 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 are important, and I think each one of us is going to have to pick the best route for our own uh, advocacy. I've decided that uh, uh, given my years in the, in uh, the public sector and the private sector, uh, that it's, it's time for me to, to uh, put my hand up with respect to the political sector. I think that the political decisions that we make, how we spend the state's tax dollars, what programs get funded, what programs don't get funded, what we want our legislators to look at in terms of bills to pass and what, what we want our legislators to, to stay away from or to change. Those are the kinds of political decisions that I think that are, are, are most important that, and that we can make differently. So I've chosen the, to spend this the last part of, of my career uh, in the political route, whereas others, especially uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the group that uh, is listening in, uh, many of them are younger, uh, can choose other ways. All of us need to work together and, and, and do what we think from where we are to go as far as we can, as fast as we can uh, to, to make these, uh, these, these changes. And yes, we have been talking about disparities in one way or another now for, for many decades. I know that I have throughout my entire career in healthcare, I, I've seen them from the time that I was a, a pre-med student to, uh, to today. And I just know that although some improvements have been made, we can do much better. Thank you. In any discussion about health issues, we have to talk about health care, health insurance. That always has to be uh, part of the conversation. And uh, Mr. Ellison and Dr. Kane have, have kind of hit on 
uh, low wage jobs, how these affect uh, the community in which we serve. Um, when we talk about access to healthcare, if we are working a job that, that does not offer healthcare or the deductible is so high, it may as well not offer healthcare. How does that impact COVID-19? How does that impact uh, getting testing, if you can even get tested yet? Um, and many of these people are working jobs that are on the front lines. They are still at the grocery store, um, you know, at restaurants, delivering the food. Um, they're pretty much called essential workers. Are they getting, are they able to get the test? And then how does this being in this situation with a lack of insurance or underinsured impact impact COVID-19? There, there, there are going to be two major effects, the direct and the indirect. The, the, the individuals that can't get care uh, because they don't have access, because they don't have insurance, or, or they are not qualified uh, for the, the state's uh, somewhat restrictive uh, Medicaid program compared to, to some other states. Uh, those are the folks that I, I truly worry about today because when they get ill, uh, they, they often uh, choose to use the emergency room and they choose to use that uh, that route far too late in their illness, and, and that's bad for uh, them, and that's bad for our, our system. But it's the indirect effects as well. This, the social isolation uh, that we are now uh, doing, uh, and uh, it's remarkable in my view that we've done it so well in, in, in so many ways, uh, is producing a, a, a tremendous hit on our economy here in Indiana and around the, around the country. Uh, we, we are going to uh, clearly have a, an economic uh, recession uh, there are a lot of folks that don't like to use that R word, but I think it's, uh, there's no doubt that it's coming. The unemployment rate in our state and in other states is going to exceed 20, 30% probably. And it's not going to come back as quickly as I'd like to see it or as that uh, everyone else would like to see it. And, and many of the people that are going to be affected by uh, that are going to be in the jobs that you just, uh, you just spoke of, the, the, the jobs that are in the, in the front lines with respect to, for instance, restaurants and and uh, with, with respect to uh, uh, the movie theaters and other things that are just not gonna bounce back like uh, you, you might want them to. And so we've got to, as a state, uh, uh, come up with uh, creative solutions. I, I believe that Indiana is exceptionally well positioned to become a leader in what we now know is a critical missing element uh, and that's medical supplies. So we already do a great deal in, in healthcare, uh, uh, pharmaceutical products and and uh, devices, but we could do much more. I, I would love it if we would then uh, dedicate ourselves to becoming the uh, medical supply hub for the, uh, for the country, uh, producing all the products that are required, especially because I believe it's many others do. This is probably not the last uh, 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 virus that's gonna be coming around that is gonna be affecting us. Uh, hopefully nowhere near as badly as, as, as uh, this one has, but uh, we, we know that uh, from the last 20 years or so, we've seen MERS, we've seen SARS, now COVID, uh, and we have the normal influenza attacks that we have every year. We, we know that these viruses are, are, are hurting us. We are not exceptionally well prepared. This, uh, this pandemic has, has shown that. Let's uh, reverse course and then say, hey, look, next time this comes around, we are going to be ready. And Indiana is going to be the leader in getting us ready and getting the nation ready. I, I just would hope that that would be one of the things that we could bring to our state to, to, to not only uh, uh, take care of current needs, but take care of future needs. And that's one of the reasons I've decided to enter the political arena to try to make that happen. I definitely think um, that people are beginning to realize this could happen more often than not with uh, pandemics epidemics, pandemics, and I and the, the jobs you mentioned, like the movie theaters, I definitely think people are going to re going to take it a little bit slow before they just go back, go back to spaces where everyone, huge groups of people gather. And so that will impact the economy as well. So, and that leads me to ask this question, because when we talk about health care and health access and access to health, we also, it's not just insurance, it's about getting to the doctor which has come up a couple of times in this conversation is about actually getting there. I think Mr. Elson said, you know, something about it's 2020, we're talking about taking an Uber to your doctor. Um, what, what can we do to make sure that people can get to the doctor? That is one of the things, and for you doctors in, in this group, you know that many times if a patient is late, you don't play those games. <laughs> you have like 15 minutes and you have to reschedule. But for some people, 
there's a barrier to get to the doctor just to get there. And even if they were 15 minutes late, that's the best they could do. And to reschedule creates a whole nother issue. So then how do we work with those patients who are trying to do what we're asking them to do? They're trying to be healthy. They're trying to come and see their doctor, but they have issues with getting there. Well, there's a, there's a saying that I like to use. If we keep doing what we're doing, we're going to keep getting what we're getting. And that means we have to change our, our approach. And, and there are a variety of components to that. One is that we need more doctors and more nurses uh, in Indiana. We need to train more. And that's uh, clearly not something that we have prioritized enough. I, I would like to get Dr. Huddleston more colleagues out there uh, in community and elsewhere around our state so that people have more access to physicians and nurses and uh, advanced practitioners of all kind. And I think also uh, we need to uh, be willing to use technology more. I, I believe that the, the state is now beginning, and uh, Dr. Sullivan can correct me, to allow uh, more telehealth visits, uh, perhaps, uh, hopefully uh, through our, our Medicaid and Medicare programs. We, we need to make them available, of course, in private insurance as well. We know that we can get a lot more done on telehealth uh, than, we, than ever before because all of us are now Zoom experts. We've been doing Zoom now successfully for, for a month and a half, so we figured that out. We can also do many aspects of healthcare uh, remotely uh, with help from uh, professionals. Uh, uh, there are now devices that you can use to measure blood pressure and so on and report that to your, to your, to your physician or your nurse practitioner uh, uh, remotely. All, those are the kinds of things that we need to take uh, much more seriously to, to, to put on the agenda, to put the policies in place right now so that we can extend uh, the ability of patients to, uh, to access uh, the, the help that they, that they need, uh, not just uh, here in Indiana, but, but around the country. So I, I think it's time for us to, to open up our, our minds to new ways to approach old problems and to produce many more people to help the folks that, that are, are, are needing help. I agree. I think this has opened our eyes to how we can be creative in, in, in solving some of these issues. Had it not been for COVID-19, maybe we would have never started, thought about using our, our technology in this way. But it's definitely forced us to use our technology and be creative. And, and, I've, and I've, I've heard about more teleservices, more people, even when it comes to mental, mental health, calling your therapist, uh, having, a, having a FaceTime chat with your therapist or even you know, your doctor just to check in. Um, and how much that has changed, and it's very accessible. It doesn't take too much time to just call up and have a quick conversation. Hey, say, hey, I don't feel well. Here's my symptoms. What should I do? Versus going to actually, when you don't feel well, the hardest thing I've always found, the hardest thing is to get, is to get dressed and get out to the doctor when I don't feel well. well so one word of caution, though. I, I don't want us to overdo that. And I, uh, and there are there going to be in-person <laughs> visits required. We, we're, we're going to be, need to be able to have Dr. Huddleston and Dr. Kane, they're going to have to examine us at some point and, and, uh, and take, take some blood samples and, and, and get our x-rays and so on. So we, we don't want to over, get overly dependent on these teleservices. But in certain visits, uh, I'm sure they can be much more uh, adequately uh, uh, or much better used. And I would like for us to expand our, our menu. That is a great caveat because it does need to be a balance. We do need to have a balance here of <laughs> in-person versus online or virtual visits. Um, I think that is all for now. With We can move on to questions. Molly, you want me to take the first question or do you have some questions from the chat? Thank you so much, Dr. Myers. Yes, thank you, Dr. Myers. I have a couple questions to kick off with, Oshia, and then I'll come right back to you for some more. Uh, I did want to offer a caveat to all of our audience members and panelists. We are getting so many great questions and so many great points. These will not be lost, even if we don't tackle them here in the last 15 minutes. With thanks to our partners at WFYI Public Broadcasting and Side Effects Public Media, we will be answering the questions we get and sharing them online through public broadcasting and on the recorder. We will make sure, especially since some of these are our public health and patient questions. Um, before I cut back to Oshia with some more questions, I actually have a burning question for Dr. Huddleston uh, that came on kind of early in the chat, uh, and so it's a practitioner question. So we have heard, obviously, that being asymptomatic, um, it's asymptomatic. You don't know. How long do you estimate that someone needs to isolate before they feel safe that they're, they're not liable to affect others? 
So this has actually changed a bit um, if you are a healthcare or essential care worker um, in the past few weeks. However, we have been telling most of our patients, if you feel that you may have been exposed, you should isolate for 14 days. And that's kind of the standard we've been using on average. And when people are out and about, even after their isolation, we're being encouraged to wear masks. Mm -hmm. Do you have any recommendations on the quality, source, type of mask that, that folks should be seeking out? There's a lot of mixed information about that one too. Um, what we have found is that you wanna reserve the N95, the high tech mask, the surgical mask, reserve that for the providers that are in the hospital caring for patients. Um, those people who are patient facing, they're the ones who need the N95s and those um, more high tech options. Um, if you're just out in public walking around, yes, your basic uh, surgical mask, and they're even recommending that you make masks just to prevent you from spreading anything you might have um, from your bodily fluids. Uh, so that's a component of barrier protection. That's really helpful. Dr. King, you look like you might have an insight, and I'm sure you do. That's, that's, you're advising folks on that all the time. Oh, just hold one second. We need to unmute you. Okay, sorry. You okay. Mm -hmm. Am I, I think I'm muted. Oh, you're fine. Can you hear me? You gotcha. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So um, I did want to just emphasize one thing that I didn't mention. You know, we have some incredible hospital systems here. I think that's really important to know. We're very fortunate. And we have one of the newest public health hospitals, Ashkenazi, that's in the country, that um, most vulnerable populations are able to go. And I, I'm an infectious disease physician, and I'm on the faculty at IU School of Medicine. And I do want to say that all of our medical school faculty have been undergoing this implicit bias training. So we are trying to really focus and emphasize that. We have some wonderful federally qualified community health centers. We've got like over 24, and they've got a lot of experience dealing with African Americans, Hispanic patients, Burmese populations. You know it. They have the cultural staff and the translations in order to address that. So, people, they use a sliding scale. You got no money, you don't have to pay. So just say that those are some tremendous resources out there. I will say though, one point I wanna emphasize, we unfortunately are limited in testing for the COVID-19. This is a question that keeps coming up in the community. We just, our health department was only able to obtain COVID testing just about 10 days ago. And our capacity is just 200, test a day. So that's why we try to focus on those essential workers, our bus drivers, you know, folks who are on the front lines, essential services, doing the testing for them. While we're trying to get to the point where we can do public testing, but we are desperately trying to find new tests, new reagents. We're told that reagents won't be available for our our machines that we use in our public health labs until June the 1st. That's just incredible to us. The reagents won't even be available to us till June the 1st. So we're doing a contract uh, with people that have a lot of expertise in these laboratory tests to try to find someone that we can find some tests, get the reagents early so we can expand to the public and the community to do more broad-based testing in these areas. So hopefully we may have some wonderful news related to that uh, within the, the week. Thank you, Dr. Kane. Uh, Dr. Sullivan, did you have anything you wanted to add about the state's testing capacity or, or future plans? Well, I certainly did wanna echo um, the sentiments that were um, stated kind of throughout. Um, first of all, I think one of the biggest highlights that we've seen of this response was uh, we've been working to enhance and open up um, telehealth and mental health policy over the last uh, three years that I've been in this role. 
And then with the opportunity to really open that up at the federal level across the entirety of all of our uh, Medicaid and community mental health center platforms has been extraordinary to watch folks have additional access to health to really decrease those barriers to care that they may have had in the past. And that will not go away when this is over. It has been an incredible win. That has always been part of the, of the growth that we've had. Um, and now being able to really accelerate that into um, rural areas, um, underserved areas has, has been extraordinary and, and very heartening. Um, additionally, uh, to uh, Carl, you'll be very excited to know that we brought on those on-demand services for um, Medicaid members for transportation, um, just actually just before uh, this pandemic, so that access to non-emergency medical transportation continues to grow. Um, and really meeting people's needs um, where they are. So the combination of those two things um, will not just during this uh, pandemic, but for the future, help us to expand services for members. And then also, you know, for folks that are worried about how they're going to get health access, um, uh, this is what we do, right? This is what we're about. Um, our entire job in social services and Medicaid delivery and early childhood education is to make sure that we're addressing those unmet social services needs. Um, the Healthy Indiana Plan is our expansion program. Everything that um, has been kind of the unique part of Indiana's um, Medicaid expansion is currently on hold. So there's no co-pays. Um, there is no cost sharing. There, none of those things that are part of HIP itself um, are in, in place right now and no one loses any of their coverage uh, during this pandemic and we will continue to learn from this on how we improve health outcomes using these programs. I also like to really talk about the two thirds, one third phenomenon when we talk about health outcomes and health disparities. In our kind of sister developed nations across the globe, um, if you kind of swirled healthcare costs and social services costs into one bucket, um, the proportion of those is flipped in the United States. We spend about two thirds of our dollars on healthcare and one third on social services. And in partner nations, it's flipped where we really think about so social services and supports first because they actually are more effective and they're less expensive. And so getting those needs met before you're sick is really critical. And we're seeing that in play right now that if we invest in those preemptive social services in public health preparedness, um, that those really expensive um, healthcare needs that we have, which are absolutely essential as you see right now, having critical care hospitals like Dr. Kane talked about at Eskenazi that can take care of the sickest patients when we most need them, those are important, but having the entire spectrum um, shored up and ready to go at a moment's notice is exactly what we're doing and seeing and learning and this collaborative effort to say, yeah, this is why. Um, we're never going to be the same after this is done. Um, uh, bruised and not, <laughs> bruised but not broken is how I describe it to our team. And, uh, and certainly, you know, from everything you're seeing on the screen, from public health prevention where Antoinette sits, um, to primary care where Dr. Harrelson sits, to the emergency department where I sit, and then all of those blended together um, makes a three-lane highway to health that I think is, is where um, we really need to go. Thank you so much. Oshia, I'd like to turn back to you for maybe a, another question or two. Yes, actually this question was asked twice, so I wanted to see if we could get an answer to it. Um, do you think the COVID-19 high mortality rates for Black Americans is due to patients being sent home and not hospitalized until it's too late? So I think, um, Dr. Kane, this might be a good question for you, and maybe Dr. Myers could chime in. So tell me the question again. I apologize. I was trying to get my call-in number for in the okay. patients that say that they can't access and get a provider they can call our call center number and we can assist them. Okay, that's, well, we want that to happen. So we want to assist people. <laughs> so so I, I have a number 317-221-5500 from eight to five, Monday through Friday. You're having difficulty finding a provider. We will assist you at our call center to help uh, related to that. Can you get that and number I know again? Dr. Sullivan has, uh, they have the state's call center, which is 24-7, I believe. And I'm, I'm going to do it for you, Jennifer. 
but their number is 877-826-0011. So, in, and it's on our website, and it's on the state uh, website, government site, so we can help find your primary care provider if you're having difficulty finding a provider. Thank so you. Now, what was my question? I'm sorry. Well, thank you so much for that information, Dr. Kane. It is, it is needed, sorely needed, and, and very valuable. Do you think that COVID-19 high mortality rates for Black Americans is due to Black patients being sent home and not hospitalized until it's too late? Honestly, no, I don't, I honestly don't think that's the case. I think our big case is that's number one, we may seek out care a little bit later uh, than our average uh, person. I also think number two, uh, we may have a higher number of patients who don't have a primary care provider and able to um, get in early for their care because they're used to doing it, some of them intermittently through emergency rooms. And with this loss of income, it puts a huge impact on our patients. And so if they're, they're not in as good a health for some of them only um, with those co-medical conditions, it just puts them at a higher risk for contracting the infection compared maybe to their white counterparts. But if they get in late and they have more comorbidities, uh, multiple medical conditions, uh, it makes them way more vulnerable and a higher risk for dying um, than uh, say their white counterparts. So I think it's a combination of factors. Um, Thank you, Dr. Kane. Uh, Dr. Hudson or Dr. Myers, do you guys want to chime in? Well, there you are, Molly. <laughs> do you guys have any thoughts you want to add? Because as we're getting pretty close on time here. I would just uh, echo what Dr. Kane, Kane has said. That there are factors that we don't fully understand yet. Uh, and that is one of the reasons why we've got to continue research uh, in all of the underlying issues surrounding these disparities. I don't want to just make the assumption that it's uh, only access. Yes, and, and I do want to make one major point that hasn't been covered in this entire conversation, if you don't mind. Please do. I think it's critical for everybody to know. So with all that trillion dollar stimulus package, are people aware that the affirmative action process has been waived by the Department of Labor? Let me say this again, the Department of Labor has waived the affirmative action process for all the stimulus packets. So there's no guidelines on a federal, state, or local level that they have to use any affirmative action guidelines as they dispense the stimulus package. So we're gonna to have to look at very carefully in terms of how much of the stimulus package are giving to racial and ethnic populations. We need to know the amount of money that's given, how many vendors may be involved in this process that are of different racial and ethnic populations because there's no accountability now if the affirmative action process has been weighed by the Department of Labor. So that's something we really need to keep our eyes on related to that and guys, this is our time to raise the living wage for everybody. People can help themselves if they can get a decent wage. And so that $7.25 an hour that's been there for 30 years, my God, we can do better for the state of Indiana and our local communities. So that's what we need, broad-based support from everybody <laughs> to get our act together and raise those raises. Well, okay, Dr. Kane. <laughs> I don't know if there's a better way to close out on that. And I think we have like two more, two more shows from that, uh, Molly. <laughs> right, and we are coming up on time, but that is a great way to end. And, and I couldn't, I definitely couldn't have said it better. So I won't say I couldn't Whoa. have said it better myself. <laughs> Um, I will say in closing, I want to thank all of our panelists. We understand that this is 
you know, a, a mighty group. This is like the world's smartest dinner party, except for me. And I'm very honored to have been here. We could have spent an hour with each one of you, but we do thank you for taking the time to share just a little bit of your expertise and taking the time right now when some of you are frontline uh, medical responders, all of you are important on the ground activists. And now is the time when you are in the most demand. Thank you so much to the Indianapolis recorder, to my, my amazing co-moderator, Oshia, and to our wonderful community partners at Side Effects Public Media and WFYI. Everyone who has been registered, everyone in our chat here, will receive feedback on the questions that have been asked. We will share the answers and we will share information through WFYI and the recorder's platforms. We are so grateful that you continue to participate in the Recorder New America series. Uh, thank you very much. If you want to check in with us, you can check the Twitter uh, hashtag COVID in Black Indie. You can find us at at Indie Recorder and at Molly G. Martin, M-O-L-L-Y-G-M-A-R-T-I-N. So with that, I will close out and wrap us up with great thanks to all of you for being guests and all of you for attending. Have a wonderful day and stay well. Thank you.